Hello, everybody. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Catherine Coleman, who is our Batson lecturer today. And uh, Kate is an associate professor in visual arts and design education and co-lead of the SWISP lab with Dr. Sarah Healy at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, University of Melbourne in Australia. And SWISP, if you hadn't heard about it before, stands for Speculative Wanderings in Space and Place. So you can already imagine where Kate is coming from. Her research and teaching are positioned in the intersection of art, design, digital, practice, culture, and not to forget data. She is a neurodivergent, feminist, artist, researcher, and teacher. Her praxis includes taking aspects of her theoretical and practical work as autographer to consider how artists, artist teachers, and artist students use sight to create place in digital and physical practice. In the chat, you will have the link to Kate's PhD thesis, which is a fantastic example of how she works because she didn't just publish it as a book, but it is a website. And that gives you a good idea of where she's coming from. She is chief investigator on the learning with the land, a social sciences and humanities research council of Canada project at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education and an academic convener for the University of Melbourne Pedaskill campus. And of course, she is a long-term proponent, researcher, and practitioner of portfolios. And that's why she is here today, because she's been a community member for a very long time, was also on the ABLE board for a few years, and is advancing the practice of portfolios, not just in Melbourne, in Australia, also by being involved in ePortfolios Australia, but worldwide, as you can see, being involved or her being involved in a Canadian Research Council project. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Kate for this year's Batson Lecture at ABLE at the annual meeting. And her lecture is entitled, The Educational Turn, Speculating on Design, Justice and Radical Times of Change. Over to you, Kate. I didn't think I need to speak after that. That was like one hell of an intro. Thank you. Um, I am very honored to be here. So thank you very much for the invitation um, to Professor Pennylight and to the ABLE board. Uh, so let me deep dive. Uh, for those of you who know me, you know that I don't do small talk and deep dive fast. So that's how I also do a lecture. <laughs> Um, so before uh, I begin, I want to acknowledge the land that I meet you from uh, and also to acknowledge the lands that you are working and living on. And I'd like to state that I inhabit this land as a settler on country, and I am aware that this land rightfully belongs to the people of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge all traditional owners of the stolen lands on which we practice, research, teach and learn. And I offer respect to all First Nations peoples present here or listening later online. In the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connections to land, sea, sky, and community knowledges. I meet you today on Wurundjeri country, uh, but I also grew up on Darug and Wiradjuri lands. This is me a couple of weeks ago at Gulumada, or what you might know as the Blue Mountains, where my paternal family has lived uh, for four generations. So I also have a QR code on my little um, spheres today, which is a beautiful um, app called Native Digital Land, and it might help you locate the land uh, that you are working on today. I think that these acknowledgements form now the beginnings of all of the portfolios that I work on with students so that we can come to understand how we know who we are in relation to place uh, in different ways. So as Christina said, I'm here to talk about the educational turn. And when I got this beautiful and generous invitation, it allowed me to start to think about the kinds of disparate places that I sometimes work. And as any keynote or lecture opportunity like, like this lets you do, pull all the strings together. 
Uh, and so my work across portfolios, my work in speculative um, design practice, and then particularly in teacher education and the scholarship of teaching and learning. Let me pull at all of those threads and think about the ways that I could position uh, Trent and Judy and the whole well, like, you know, collection of colleagues that I had through ABLE together and think then about how we might speculate on using design justice and feminist design principles to think about what radical times of change are in higher education and to push and prod at some of those things and understand the kind of times that we live in. Um, it, very nice to hear Cindy's um, lovely mapping of skills. And I'm going to push at skills a little bit because I think that they might have taken over a little bit of our work for some time and that maybe we need to go to the underside, which I loved those last questions about what do we need to do with these cross-cutting skills and how do we reimagine them? So I want to begin with where we are in higher education at this moment. Um, and we know that the pandemic has has shifted um, and disrupted, even though that now Clayton Christensen term has been uh, abused by capitalism, but disrupted the status quo in education. Um, we know this from major reports from the OECD. Uh, and if you don't know the work of social scientist, Professor Deborah Lupton, you can also have a look at these large cartographies of this disruption to society. Uh, and many of us have been thinking about what this disruption looks like in our own educational research. We are still feeling the resonations of international and state border closures that limited access to new student cohorts and necessary fun funding and increasing casualized workforce and institutional, professional and academic divide. And these ruptures and sector-wide financial devastations impact our daily work. Uh, I know that many universities have been on strike at the moment, as have mine, to actually try and um, counter offence these financial impacts that are really impacting on the ways that we work and the ways that our students experience higher education. So during the pivot to remote teaching and learning and working and researching from home, we had a multitude of demands placed on us. For some, these demands initiated an opportunity to innovate and create new ways of practicing and teaching as researchers. For others, it widened gaping disparities and inequities across faculties and institutions, communities and societies. Before the pandemic, though, the university sector had been shifting. Many in the academy were doing the work to decolonize curriculum, rupture systems and structures, and turn toward a relational production of knowing and knowledge. And for those of us in the portfolio space, we had been doing this for two decades. There were questions about the purpose and role of higher education in our communities as teaching, learning, assessment and graduate preparedness continued to change. In 2000, what provoked much of my work was the work of Ronald Barnett, uh, who said, in an age of super complexity, a new epistemology for the university awaits one that is open, bold, engaging, accessible, and conscious of its own insecurity. It is an epistemology for living amid uncertainty. Now, those words continue to reverberate for me uh, as we land, um, for me, in the middle of a year, um, a massive year of uncertainty in higher education as I try and <clears throat> navigate the kinds of students that I'm currently teaching with the pressures and stresses of financial insecurity and mental health crises at the same time as dealing with this casualized workforce. And so I think that that super complexity term is something for us to pick up and to run with. So during the initial stages of the global pandemic, the pandemic turned our focus sharply toward a care for students and their well-being. And we really did this in really diverse ways. Our relational encounters between physical and digital spaces and for some post-digital sites changed how we taught and thought about teaching. With financial difficulties, access and equity issues and political agendas playing out in and around the education sector, the catalyst for the educational turn in higher education was not the pandemic on its own, but several increasing demands that contributed over many years. Educators reached the tipping point in lockdown. So if we are to begin with thinking that we are in the midst of an educational turn. How might we speculate on design justice? 
in radical times of change. So I've positioned this like a book. I like to think in terms of front matter and middle matter and back matter. The front matter is this book that I worked on with my faculty when we began to think about what the educational turn might be. Um, and the opening chapter is by Mike Prosser, the guru of social, uh, and Karina Waller, a wonderful professor I work with at the University of Melbourne, who wrote a chapter called The Rapidly Changing Teaching and Research Landscape. I preface this as the front matter for us to think in this hour about the kind of work that we need to do as scholars in the academy uh, to record and archive and tell the story of this change and then to think um, about a what if or what might come after. And so what does it mean to look at the kinds of work we're doing at this moment, but preface them in a future casting? What does it actually mean for students and not about employability or the kinds of skills that they need for a workforce, but what do they actually need to be able to exist and contribute to a world that has had such a rupture? And what does it mean to give the kind of ethics of care that students need in this space. And we know that portfolios enable that. So how do we position those portfolios in the scholarship of teaching and learning uh, and do the work that needs to be done around it? For me, the educational turn places Soto at the center of informing theory and, and practice and how we might speculate a return to Soto. So how we might engage in a broader scholarship of teaching and learning broader than a disciplinary focus around educational research and what works or what matters, but what actually um, we need in this current world and how we might actually reworld our way of thinking. And if we think about a concept of rewilding, which I do a lot in my research, what does it mean to rewild the portfolio, to undo its tethers that it has connected to employability and to think more broadly about the kind of human being that portfolios enable people to become and to think of those in terms of becoming and being uh, and in a generative relational way use them and preface that work because I think that we are in a place at this moment if we consider the educational turn about what we can think around assessment about teaching and about learning and instead of flicking back or the flip back that we sometimes refer to about a pre-COVID time, think differently about what we all just did and then reconsider what might come next. So in my front matter, I also position um, three big bits of thinking that I uh, continue to return to a lot, but I'm going to pull together for this lecture. So the first is um, now a teenage thought. Um, and if we think about what adolescent thoughts might be, I think it's interesting to go into this bit of adolescent thinking and wonder about why it's still so pertinent. So in 2010, Helen and Tracy uh, said, as containers of authentic evidence of student work, e-portfolios can serve as a catalyst for conversations among faculty and other stakeholders within departments and programs about common learning outcomes, coherence among courses and professional development. Now, that could have just been written today uh, because some of the arguments that we have, we keep returning to. Um, I feel like I, there needs to be a moment if it is a turn and we take that sociological concept of turn that we draw a line and then we think about what comes next. Um, and if, if we do know that this works, which we do, we have multiple um, containers of empirical evidence about e-portfolios and practice in higher education, then how might we actually think about what the wicked problems of today are and actually just agree that here's where we are and where do we go next? In 2012, Trent continued, because portfolios work best in an evidence-based learning environment and since the evidence-based paradigm is a far stretch from dominant educational designs, uh, e-portfolio use at scale on campus will take time. So this epistemic change um, that Trent is referring to. Uh, I pick up here in the work of Randy Bass in 2000, who positions the wicked problem. So I'm thinking around this space of knowing and unknowing and how we might actually respond to these times. Randy actually published this right at the start of lockdown for me. 
Um, and so when I picked up on Ron Barnett's work of super complexity and I located in all of the work that was happening, you could see that the educational turn had been coming for some time and been a call from higher education leaders uh, that we needed to actually rethink what it is that higher education was doing, particularly in a, in a time of capitalism and the capitalist uh, university. We now know that we've been in an educational turn. We often hear the concept of the university in ruins. Well, what does that actually mean to rebuild and how might we position the practices that we have as portfolio scholars of teaching and learning to do some of that rethinking and contribute to uh, higher education more broadly. So the radical bit in radical times, uh, I continuously refer to, uh, for any other radical in the room, you will know how this word um, resonates for yourself. But I have to, in my front matter position that I see myself as a radical educator, uh, as an activist and agitator, to, to really think about the kinds of um, ways that we think about access you know, who has access and whose voices are heard, whose voices are reified, uh, whose voices are unheard uh, or misheard. Uh, and what does that mean in a time of fact and truth? And whose facts and whose truths are we working with um, in higher education? I think that the concept of fact and truth when we think radically about pedagogy is an interesting place to position a concept of portfolio, particularly in the age of AI. And what does it mean to actually um, teach critical thinking, um, to teach the metacognition required to engage in computational thinking with AI as collaborator and to understand the more than human um, and non-human relations in education? These are for me definitely radical times. So the context of my thinking here um, is around what's going on in the world. And I know that you all know this, but I think that sometimes the evidence around the context of time when we're assessing and teaching and working with young people in higher education um, sometimes is important to stop and think about because we know the affect on our bodies in higher education um, given what's happening but I wanted to piece this together because for me this prefaces the kinds of theoretical spaces that I'm working in. So amidst a global mental health crisis uh, we continue to see mental health related hospital admissions globally rise. So these are post COVID-19 restric restriction periods. This is an article I captured a couple of months ago in pediatrics about hospital admissions for adolescents and the overall uh, mental health crises that we see, particularly in young um, non-binary female uh, or socioeconomically disadvantaged areas. Um, the, these are the students that we're teaching. And so what does it actually mean to, to use a device or a technology or a space or a place, whatever generative term we then might add to that, to work with young people, to engage with where they actually are in the world, uh, to use Gert Biester's language there. How do we actually support young people to be in their worlds and to make sense of their worlds, given that this is the world that they're living in. Uh, this is from July 4, when the globe hit uh, its hottest day in the climate catastrophe. So what does the climate crisis actually mean to young people? We know that it's in their top thinking about what's going on in the world. They're not really interested in what the employment skills are for them knowing that they live in climate catastrophe and climate crises. We were told, I think at the start of this year, I remember the day being marked on the news that we had hit the 1.2 degrees that you know we had talked in Paris um, negotiations about for years. And here we already were on that day and it passed on the news like it was kind of a little report of a car accident. And then on July 4, um, the globe sweltered in its hottest day. We see French riot police stand guard during clashes in Lyon recently. We know the Black Lives Matter movement um, and the impact that it had on, at least in the US, I know, and in Australia, what it's had. Um, but to actually start to see that in France and then a misunderstanding around the digital and virtual environments come from the president 
was one of those moments for me in the educational turn to pay attention, pay attention to. How do we understand the kind of crises that young people currently live and learn in? And what, what does that actually mean to disciplinary knowledge and to disciplinary content and to engaging in workplaces that many of them see as really problematic? And so, you know, if this is the world that you are living in, then what next? The other big complexity that I think that the university has somehow forgotten is that you're, we're literally still in the midst of a pandemic. I remember news sometime last year when there was a epidemiologist who was talking about, you know, a potential of 300 years or what that might mean for an end of this time. Well, so what do these crisis times actually represent for young people? What does it mean when they see a number like 767 million confirmed cases and 6.9 million deaths? And we know that not all of those have been reported appropriately. And we also understand the problematics of right-wing media, particularly Murdoch, um, who you know, tells a very different kind of narrative to people. What are the critical literacies and competencies in those to actually needed to be able to navigate the kind of world that we're living in. And then the super complexity of AI um, and understanding the concept of, of race, um, of bias, of understanding how facial recognition uh, algorithms work, for instance. How do we have our language or literacy or competency around algorithmic thinking? How do we understand how to engage in computational language? What is it about the e-portfolio in its WYSIWYG click and drag nature that doesn't engage in all of the complexity of digital literacies and how do we actually come to understand what it means to live in a digital world that has a very particular bias and prejudice built in and so how do we front load those prejudices and have that conversation Social scientist Kate Crawford has advanced the idea that the biggest threat from AI systems is not that they become smarter than humans, but rather that they will hard code sexism, racism, and other forms of discrimination into the digital infrastructure of our societies. This work um, by Joy in the, in, as the founder of Algorithmic Just, Justice League is worth really deep diving into if you want to understand the problems uh, of AI and the ways that we come to understand the training. You know, what are those um, trillion prompts and uh, uh, information bites that it is fed and how does it understand who we are and how humans function? Uh, if we actually don't really start to talk about what this um, colonial way of reflecting education through artificial intelligence is in a time when the institution is trying to be anti-colonial and anti-racist, the fear of AI and assessment is not the fear that we should actually be having. The fear is um, a bias uh, that's particularly focused on, on white, cis, heterosexual men. And what happens to the rest of us uh, in that environment is a question to wonder about. If software fails us, then how do we actually take another step um, and as Kate Crawford presents, how do we deal with what the privilege hazard is uh, in action and, and reify that conversation so that we um, can actually have these conversations with our students about training? What does it actually mean when I'm training Chatty G? And how do I come to understand, you know, what that um, T actually means? Is it actually generative, not in the ways that we think about it, at least in my field? I said that we have a mental health crisis, but in Australia we'll also have, and I know that North America is in the same position as on most parts of the EU, uh, financial strain. So I'm teaching students who cannot afford to pay their rent. Uh, and, and I just pick up on the bottom of this. The top three reasons for financial stress amongst those, and this is from our um, government research for banking, looked at young people budgeting and juggling everything from their rise in cost of living. They have no savings. They have no savings for emergencies and they have no savings for unexpected expenses because we spent, we closed down. And so who survived it? Those of us with desk jobs, 
those of us with teaching who could actually go home and work. But for everybody else, we actually saw a major shift in how people could actually engage in earning a living and, and being in the world as an active citizen. What does citizenship actually mean in this time of crises? And how might we even locate concepts of, of citizenship and trouble those concepts with students in our portfolios to rethink um, the world that we live in? We recently had Ida Hobbit Day or the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Intersex Phobia and Transphobia. And if you haven't read this statement from UN Women, I think this is an important statement to read and to discuss with students about this moment in time. And as I said, I've just captured what's gone on in the last two months. This is active and present in the, in the people that we teach, the people that come to learn with us. And so what does it mean to actually be able to have complex, or as Barnett put it, super complex conversations with young people, to engage in disciplinary um, dialogue, to have the discourse to engage in the creation of knowledge, not just the transaction of knowledge where I come and be told something and then I you know, now have to write on a piece of paper to do a test because I'm apparently a cheater and I can't be trusted uh, to do any form of assessment without uh, AI detection. What does this mean in this world right now? That really feels like it's thrown itself upside down. Um, and how do, what does it mean to come and sit inside my lecture theatre uh, and to make sense of things going forward? So with all of those socio-cultural, political, economic impacts, this is a trend that I've been watching in another part of my work. Uh, and the shift that occurred during um, lockdown, the, the cloak of COVID is what I call it in higher education, where many changes occurred. This edtech market shift, I believe, is a major change for us to pay attention to. So we have students who are struggling to actually participate um, in the context of higher education. At the same time as the university system itself investing billions of dollars in educational technology, many of them as surveillance tools, at least during COVID. Now that we have AI, greater surveillance tools, um, what does it actually mean to have those cops that are so, if you think back to that image of Leon, what does it mean to have those cops in our classroom and to say that Turnitin is detecting you, the way that you write that assessment, because you potentially write uh, in a language other than English, and you use a tool to transcribe that, and that transcription is now being detected as plagiarism. Now, these are the kinds of super complexities that I think that we need to really grasp um, and to take a position on and to understand how it works in our institution. Um, if, if we can see that, you know, th these, this billion dollar industry and its impact and affect on the ways that we work, um, and we put that together with the kinds of lives that our students are living, what does that actually mean inside the classroom? So if the hybrid education is the next normal, then how do we actually combat that? What does it mean for learning and teaching and assessment? Um, if we are going to see the end of what they call monolithic structures, for those of you who have been in the open badge space, like myself, I think that that's probably a slower burn. And I think that that's straight up capitalism. Uh, let's sell to those people who are in financial need, uh, very expensive degrees uh, at a micro level, but that's me being cynical. Um, what does it mean, you know, when we go into India and we recolonize another space and sell content uh, to other places? And how do we actually start to thinking think about um, what it means to skill up our leadership. Um, what does leadership in higher education actually need for those of us who are either in managerial or leadership roles or choose to lead in the institution through agitation? What is the kind of skilling that we need to actually be able to deal with the kinds of shifts and changes that we see in the ed tech market? I mean, one of the wonderful things that I saw happen in Australia during um, this growth in 21-22 was the surge of e-portfolio platforms. But what does it actually mean if we're not doing the work around those portfolios, not just supporting staff, but supporting faculty to actually shift 
into that epistemic belief change that Trent referred to in 2012. Um, that takes time. Faculty work takes time. We cannot change the ways that we understand ontologically our worldviews, but epistemically how we understand knowledge and knowledge to be constructed. That is, that is a slow burn. And so how do we in this particularly fast paced market uh, ensure that we're ready for those changes? If you haven't read this innovative pedagogy um, book that just came out from the Open University, this is one to go to because I feel like this is my like rise to a point um, in my storyline. I caught this a couple of weeks ago when it landed somewhere in one of my social feeds. But for me, it actually gave me and my own research space and my lab that I work in, it gave us our contents page. And this is the kind of work that I'm doing. But what did it mean to actually start seeing it um, laid out as something that we needed to be thinking about in terms of innovating? Because I know that my work is often seen as um, quite disruptive and uh, not necessarily mainstream. And so what does, it, what does it say when it's presented here in that way? Because these are really difficult bits of work to do with students as well. Um, who have strategized and been successful in a standardized education space. And then they come to higher education and I ask them to undo all of that, unlearn everything that you just did for 13 years and we're gonna start again. These things are really hard to talk about. You know, what, what does it mean podcast is pedagogy? You want me to actually engage in a podcast in a flipped learning experience before I come. And when I turn up to class, I want, my, I want you to have questions when you're working two jobs to pay the rent how do we actually do these things and what does it mean to truly innovate in pedagogy knowing that we can't really have an innovative pedagogy unless we've got an innovative higher education field um, and how do we actually set up the types of innovations um, that we can not just speculate upon but begin to play a role in so as I said, I hit my point in the arc where I was like, okay, so here's the context that I sit in. So what? A couple of big ideas that uh, I think that the ePortfolio community might be able to begin to engage with in different ways. Um, design justice for me is something that we need to actually start to consider in terms of a type of practice that asks us to think about concepts of design in a multiplicitous way. So we ask students to be designer, often without teaching them any UX or UI. We work with learning designers who are often so frustrated because they design these wonderful things and then they end up in a classroom and the realization of the design doesn't occur. Um, we work in evidence-based inquiry, but sometimes the systems themselves are not about evidence. They're literally just about competency, but I'm being asked to put a scale of standards against those grades. Um, we work in the super complex place of evidence of impact. So what does it mean for ourselves as higher education um, members to actually continuously demonstrate impact? And what does it actually mean to have impact in the world as scholars of teaching and learning? Uh, and scholars in our disciplines? And how do we start to engage in what it means to actually design assessment, to design our classrooms, to design our learning management systems, um, and to help students engage in the design of their lives? Um, we know that design has such an impact on everything that we do in our world. Uh, it impacts in every single um, decision that I make from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. And so thinking with a de design justice lens also prefaces justice. What does it mean to have a just environment that students can live and work uh, and present their work in? If you ask a student to come to a portfolio course or a portfolio subject without a sense of justice, you ask them to open up so much about their lives to position, and positionality is really difficult for many people, uh, unless you're incredibly privileged in higher education. And even those um, people who are not first in families sometimes find that positioning in higher education as a scholar difficult. 
So how do we use a design justice lens to think differently about what design marginalizes? What does that positionality or front page about me actually do? How do you open up that, that um, cabinet of wonder about yourself to an assessor, to an employer? And how do you actually trust that that is going to um, be read with sincerity, with, um, with anything that's generative? I, I think that some of the things that we ask in portfolios, we need to query with a design and justice focus. What am I actually asking students to present about themselves and to whom uh, and for what? What does it mean to tell my story? And storytelling is an incredibly powerful methodology for those of you who work as storytellers, not just use a method of story, but true storytelling. We know culturally storytelling uh, is incredibly important. I live in a country that's 60,000 years old and knows who it is and what it's done because of its stories. Those stories are really powerful things, but they need to be cared for and they need to be shaped and they need to be looked after. So where's the design justice in the storytelling of a portfolio? We can question and we can think differently about evaluation. How am I evaluating someone's story in the first place? How am I assessing someone's lived experience? And is there a different way for us to maybe have a conversation about how we present, what we present, and how, who we present it to when we start to think about a design justice for evidence-based learning. The other thing to think with for me about portfolios uh, is to locate it inside a radical education. We know that they don't work in standards-based assessment frameworks. They can't because you can't standardize it. They are spaces of social science work. And to me, they do the interdisciplinary kind of practice that we want students to engage in when we're in, particularly in these crazy has stem debates. What does it mean to be a radical educator and to ask students to come into a socially just environment that positions them and their lived experience inside a discipline? And when we start to engage in knowledge in that way, what does it mean when we liberate um, and taking here uh, Paolo Freire and Bell Hooks. What does it mean to liberate someone from a condition that they live in, particularly in these times of crises, and position them to use the knowledges that they are now engaging with to restore what those hope um, hopes might be? And what if we ask them about what they're hopeful for? Uh, and we position that inside our just field classroom. And not necessarily a class that is about social justice, because I think that that social diminishes it. But what does it mean to just be a just educator um, and to invite e-portfolios into a place for justice? What does a just portfolio actually indicate? And how am I able to actually not be in a transaction with knowledge, but a truly relational one and tell you what I now know? what I knew before and what I now know and what the impact of that for my future might be is a really interesting place um, to think in radical education. Something I think that we need to pay attention to in the educational turn and portfolios are the feminist data principles. Catherine and Lauren positioned in 2020 right in global lockdown this powerful book that I think that higher education needs to pay attention to but particularly those of us who work in data you know, we ask students to curate their data in a portfolio. We don't always talk about it as data, but it is their data. It's lived experience data of being a student within this discourse, in this particular environment. And then I ask you to tell me that narrative. Well, what does it mean to take the feminist data principles, seven principles that are really powerful and important, to challenge power? How, do, how does a student using a design justice focus challenge power within higher education and e-portfolio? Well, they are doing it because they are creating knowledge. They're not responding to knowledge. They're not sitting in an exam and telling somebody what somebody else knows and how they've wrote, learned it and spat it back out. They're truly embodying that knowledge and then being able to translate it into their own lived experience through a new narrative through their own multi-literacies in a multimodal way. 
that's incredibly powerful for us to begin to think with. The feminist um, data principles ask us to embrace pluralism. To me, something that is inherent in the ways that we think about portfolios and portfolio assessment. They ask us to make the work visible, show your work as a feminist data principle. How did you do this? Not just reflect on the experience of being in the course. Tell me how you just did this portfolio. What does that mean? So do we need to have beavers with our portfolios more often? Or do we need to ask them to engage in their multi-literacies and to begin the portfolio with a podcast? Take that podcast pedagogy and let me listen to you as you talk me through your portfolio. I've asked my students to do that and I can tell you it changes the way I engage with their work wholeheartedly as they talk to me and I work my way through their pages. In our challenging of power, it asks us to examine power. Whose powers? Um, what, does, what does knowledge hierarchies actually signify in the institution? And if we're asking students to bring their actual true selves and consider their context in our space, how do we together with them examine power relations? Um, and flatten those spaces. We know that portfolios flatten hierarchies in assessment. They actually position me and my students in a very flat ontology. I, I go into a shared worldview with them when I'm in a portfolio. I'm not ticking things off and checking things are here and there. I'm engaging with their story and I'm working through their artifacts to understand where they are at that particular moment in time and how well they know it. And what do I need to teach next? I sit in my scholarship of teaching and learning cycle trying to understand, okay, so this is where you're at. What, what did we not do, given that portfolio is evidence of what we've just done in class? They're not what I stayed up till 3 a.m. doing. If I am embracing pluralism and I am thinking about embodiment in a different way and engaging with knowledge, the way that I think about portfolios is as a career, eh? William Pinar's work, and then the work of Rita Irwin at UBC completely shifted the way that I understood your portfolios. And I worked on this deeply in my PhD, but the concept of the storytelling when we think of the living curriculum is a way to take design justice and the feminist design principles and to locate that querying of power and to give the story over to the student. So Grume and Piner in the 1970s talked about the, the Latin definition of curriculum, meaning to run the course. How do, we, how do we actually engage in the running of knowledge at this particular moment in time? Knowing that curriculum is just a snapshot or collection of that knowledge in that moment, knowing that it changes again after it's already been documented and that policy is developed. So how do we run the course with students and actually talk to them about um, the curriculum that they're sitting within. What is the lived experience you bring and how, do we, how are we engaging with it in this curriculum? And this is why this portfolio matters because it asks you to engage in designing your own curriculum to think about where you have been and where you go. And the concept here of Pinars in 1975 of these, the autobiographical and educational past. So where have you been? How, where, who got you here? What are those stories that your grandmother told you that have enabled you to enter into this field? And how do I actually engage with them um, through analysis and a turn to what I position my past and present and futures to be? Not a future that's in 20 years or 30 years or five years. If we take an Indigenous understanding of knowledge as uh, of future as now, these are we live in the future. So what do I actually need to engage in these futures? And what do students need to present in their portfolios that can indicate the futures that they are becoming into? Not a skill that I'm going to need to be employed in who knows where, because I don't think that it's our responsibility in higher education to be somebody's pathway to employment. We look after and care for people. We teach them and we learn with them about our disciplinary discourse and a broader interdisciplinary environment in a larger context? How do we engage them in this synthetic turn uh, as Pine are presented around experience and the larger political cultural context to make sense of where we are? So 
I took you through a big, massive part of my brain. Some places that I think with um, in a whole range of different contexts. But in my back matter, I wanted to preface some thinking and questions with you. In thinking about this super complex crisis, and if we take the climate language of catastrophic, what does that actually mean to live in the Anthropocene? And what does an anthropocenic higher education actually need? What does it need from us? What does it need for our students? And what do we need to reimagine? What do we need to rethink? What do we need to reconsider? What do we need to challenge about unequal power structures? How do we work towards justice? How do we think about multiple forms of knowledge? How do we think about knowledge that comes from the people that we teach and they're living? What is the knowledge that they bring into my room? Do I have to wait to see it in a portfolio or can I completely change the way that I'm teaching to engage with living and feeling bodies in the world in my classroom every day? But how, how do we actually do that? Because that's really, that's really super complex. How do we challenge the concept of the binary? How do we rethink binaries and hierarchies? What does it actually mean to really challenge a concept of the binary, of this or that? And then if we put it into our students' bodies in our classrooms of the gender binary, what, is, what does that actually mean? How do we try and push against perpetuating oppression? How do we only enable a few? We teach the masses. What does that actually mean to actually teach a broad um, community of people knowing that only a few will actually be able to do this? Or only a few get those top marks? You know, or only a few will succeed. Well, what does that actually mean for us and how might we rethink it? How do we prioritise local land and culture inside our teaching? Do you know what Indigenous lands you work on? Do you actually know the cultures that you teach in? Who, who is this multiplicitous, multilingual, plurilingual, pluriverse that we live and teach in? And how might our experiential ways of knowing that we harness in the e-portfolio world, how might that actually help us shape what those multiple perspectives look like in our classroom? How does a student who speaks five languages get to tell you that story and you don't have to wait till the e-portfolio to see it. Because that's incredibly important when a student is bringing a plurilingual and pluricultural understanding to knowledge. But how do we actually engage with that? How do we preface the lived experience? How do we preface the teaching and the learning like we try to preface it in our assessment? And if we think then about data, because to me, that's what students are curating. They are curating these multifaceted data collections. A lot of it, social science data, if we think of it like that, small data, small personal data. We think really ethically and carefully when we collect photographs and videos of personal stories of people. So how do we preface the ethics in our students' portfolios to ensure that they understand what that data is and what that data is evidence of and what it actually means when it's all pieced together because it's pieced together in a way that you've never told it. You know, we've from the paper-based portfolios and the ways that we've even talked about scrapbooking and photo albums and all of the metaphors, we know they're incredibly important. But the ethics of those are just as important. So how do we ensure that we don't get these unequal power relations, that a student who is opening oneself to the world doesn't get just a pass on that portfolio what does that, what does that actually mean and what are we actually assessing and how do we work out what we're assessing very clearly so that we don't shift that power structure when we ask someone to come in in a flat context um, what does it mean to have an accurate and ethical analysis of portfolios and how do we make labor visible in terms of assessment what does it mean to have many hands in portfolios. I remember years and years ago, I don't even remember where I was, um, being in one of the AACU rubrics and people workshopping portfolios together. That to me was one of those work of many hands moments. 
how do we invite people to really engage in our portfolios in different ways instead of the individual narrative um, that comes to me so that the labour is visible because we know how hard these things are. They're incredibly difficult for students to do, but they're difficult because of what, they, what we know they help them become in that sense of becoming. Um, so the recognition and value is presented and upfront. And so my questions to leave you with that have been sitting in front of you while I have rambled through my thinking is what might we reimagine for learners in this time of radical change? And I um, am using super complexity and Randy Bass's wicked problems. What might we reimagine? Not do we, what, what do we need to do? But what, it, or what could we do? But what might we reimagine? That speculative language is not a slight difference. It's a very big change in how we might think about what portfolios can do in this moment. What? Learning, technology, assessment, classroom, LMS, blah, blah, blah. We know all the ends, all the bits of the institution. What do these designs need for our futures? How do we impact with a design justice or through design justice on our technologies and assessments and classrooms? What does it mean to have a just classroom? What does the design of that space actually look like in our learning environments? How might we rethink what professional learning faculty need to design for problem posing authentic evidence-based learning assessment? Men, they need a lot of work. They don't need an intro to the tool. They need an epistemic belief professional learning experience? What does it mean to actually change the ways that I have been taught, the way I've experienced success? Because we know that's what teaches us how to engage with learning. How do we actually change that focus given the crises that we live amongst? Our, our colleagues and us are in this exact same space. So how do we use a pedagogy of care and kindness to change that environment? And what pedagogies and practices might we need for a just, equitable and anti-colonial form of e-portfolio assessment that doesn't whitewash assessment when we ask for a true lived experience in the pluriverse, in a multilingual environment that wants to be engaging and wants to be just filled uh, and wants to be generative. How do we make sure that we don't recolonize a form of assessment that is trying to do the anti-racist, anti-colonial work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate, for taking us through a very provocative topic and posing so many questions to us that can in itself pretty much, I think, already be a curriculum and provide a roadmap for lots of um, continuing conversations that we should be having as community, picking bits out to start with and then go further and explore from there. We do have a few minutes time if anybody has any questions or would like to share some comments. Kate, I just wanna echo um the thoughts of, of thanks from christina and uh wow did we ever choose well uh in asking you to to join us and i i just think there's so much there that we could and should be taking up and i i guess my question is because i love it all where do you think we should start you know if, if abel was going to design a trajectory over the next year for for you know sort of deepening thinking around these these different questions where do you recommend we start um justice just comes to mind i think that um a concept of well of design justice and then a just a justice focused assessment would help shift our thinking around I think the problematics of evidence it's just uh, I totally believe in an evidence-based learning but it's so problematized like disruption in the institution that it ends up being a ticker box experience rather than true evidence of learning and so it actually changes its focus and so what does it mean to create an assessment that is just 
because uh, th that's what I do truly believe ePortfolios to be. But I think that that isn't just a language change. It really is. That's the epistemic change that, you know, you and Tracy have written about for a long time. Trent has written about for a long time. All of us have. The concept, UNESCO has this really beautiful, even though it's all, almost um, problematic, but a concept of human flourishing, um, which could easily be, you know, misconstrued. But I like the idea of, a, of human flourishing and justice. And what does that actually mean for portfolios, I think is a way for us to think about the what next. If we literally draw the line in the sand and go, okay, so we know, we know they work. What do we need to do for, for times of super complexity? I think that um, the voices that we've left out of higher education, uh, it's a good, good time for um, the, the justice for those voices to be heard. I think maybe some of us are a bit overwhelmed because you, you you were giving us so many so many concepts so many ideas so many points to consider that um i'm i'm really also happy that we have the recording of your your lecture because i think that is something that we all will need to go back to and and dissect a bit more slowly and make our way through. And then thank you so much for, for having given us that starting point, Kate, so that we can get going from there. And as community, think about um, what future events we might want to offer in that regard to workshop around some of those topics, to explore them together collaboratively and um, help with that sense making and make sense of that complexity, explore it and see where we then want to take something back to our own organizations. We need to go and sleep with it. Sleeping with thinking is important. That is actually a very good transition because I suspect a number of you are on the US East Coast or maybe in the in the middle of the, the North American continent. And so it is getting closer to, to your bedtime. Therefore, um, very good point in sleeping on it, uh, digesting it overnight, ruminating over it. Um, but please don't forget to come back tomorrow for the second day of the ABLE conference, because we will continue our conversations around all the things e-portfolio, design justice, artificial intelligence. And so please make sure to check the program. There is a special session with which we will start, which will be fantastic. Um, and uh, Tracy is going to moderate that. So we look forward to it. And then of course, those of you that are traveling to Vancouver, you can actually talk in person next week between the 19th and 21st, and maybe even explore some of those concepts in the workshops um, or in the networking sessions, or even during some of the sessions that are being offered. So we look forward to seeing you back tomorrow and then um, everybody who's going to Vancouver uh, next week as well. Have a wonderful evening, early evening, afternoon, or in Kate's case, morning, and we'll see you later. Have a good day.